Well, good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Hope everyone's doing well. Um, we're here, uh, another class on the book of James. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about wisdom. Um, and this is coming out of James chapter 3. Now, this is lesson 8, so after tonight we only have four lessons left. Um, I think there's three more um, until Thanksgiving, uh, and then we're going to have a Devo on, on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and then one more lesson after that, but we're, we're coming to a close. Tonight I want to start off with a, with a story. There was an old man who had retired and had bought a small home near a junior high. He spent the first few weeks of his retirement in peace and quiet and contentment. Then a new school year began. And every afternoon, three young boys, full of youthful and after-school enthusiasm, would come down his street, past his house, beating merrily on every trash can they encountered. Now, side note, I promise this has nothing to do with the Astros. I just happened to find the story. I thought it was good. Day after day, the three boys, young Jose, Alex, and Jordan, continued their crashing percussion. <laughs> I, like I said, it's not about the Astros. Day after day, the three boys continued their crashing, crashing percussion until finally the old man decided it was time to take some action. The next afternoon, he walked out to meet the young boys as the loud banging of the cans made its way down the street. The old man stopped them and said, you kids seem to be having a lot of fun. I like to see you express your exuberance like that. In fact, I used to do the same thing when I was your age. So will you kids do me a small favor? I'll give you each a dollar if you promise to come by every day and beat on the trash cans. The kids were elated and continued in their daily raucous routine. After a few days, the old man greeted the kids uh, again, but this time he had a sad smile on his face. He said to the boys, this recession is really putting a dent in my income. From now on, I'll only be able to pay you 50 cents to beat on the trash cans. The boys were obviously displeased, but they accepted the offer and they continued their afternoon daily ritual. A few days later, the old man approached them one more time as they drummed their way down the street. He said, look, I haven't received my social security check this month. I'm only going to be able to give you 25 cents. Is that okay? One lousy quarter, said one of the boys. If you think we're going to waste our time beating these cans for one quarter, you have lost your mind. We are done. No way. After that, the wise old man enjoyed peace and tranquility for the rest of his days. So like I said, tonight we're talking about wisdom, and specifically the wisdom that James talks about. And he talks about two different kinds of wisdom, and that's wisdom from heaven and wisdom from the world, and how uh, those types of wisdom shape the world we live in. So naturally, when I'm coming into a lesson like this, I, I go to Google. What does Google say wisdom is? Google defines wisdom as the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. And this is the sense of quality, uh, or a sense of wisdom being kind of a quality we have. If we have these things, um, and we have, we have these things as part of our life, then, then we have wisdom. Um, but then it also defines wisdom in the sense of how we use this wisdom, and it's the soundness of an action or decision with regard to the application of those experiences, that knowledge, and that good judgment. Now, <clears throat> I look at this, and this seems like a pretty standard definition. Don't have uh, huge issues with this. Uh, we typically look at experience as being something that's associated with age. Uh, we typically look at knowledge being as something that's associated with education or something that we've developed over a long period of time. And to me, good judgment's one of those things that's kind of the culmination of experience and knowledge. And uh, putting those two things together um, to uh, come out with a positive uh, outcome. Uh, but the problem is, to me with this definition, is that experience, knowledge, and good judgment in most instances, most instances are subjective qualities. What is experience? What is knowledge? What is good judgment? We, if I were to ask you that, you may give me one answer. If I were to go down the street, ask somebody else, they may have a different answer. Um, so it's something we all may have different opinions about. I also wanted to, to get a different perspective on this, so I went to Webster's to see what Webster's defined as wisdom. And this is a screenshot of what I found online, and it's kind of the same, same kind of deal, good judgment, insight, knowledge. But one thing that kind of stands out to me with this definition is uh, subpart C down here. Wisdom is a generally accepted belief. Uh, now, what does that mean? 
Um, does this mean that wisdom is determined by the latest trends, by what's popular, um, by the latest polling data? And that's kind of a scary thing to think about, that wisdom can be dictated in such an easy way. But I think that's probably true, uh, at least of the worldly wisdom we're going to talk about. Things that were socially um, unwise just a few years ago, think back 50 years, 20 years, 10 years, pick a time. You can probably think, think of some things that were socially unwise just not too long ago that are often considered socially wise today, and even vice versa. But all this really means is that there are different kinds of wisdom. And that's what James is going to be telling us tonight. And that's going to be the basis of our lesson. Now, the Old Testament talks a lot about wisdom. There's a lot of instruction in the book of Proverbs and Psalms, things like that, that encourage us to seek after wisdom. Likewise, in the New Testament, we're encouraged to walk with wisdom. Ephesians chapter 5 um, and verse 15 says, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. <clears throat> and then we get into our verse for tonight. So we're going to be in the book of, uh, book of James chap chapter 3 tonight. We're going to be starting in verse 13. <clears throat> and it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Um, and then the verses after this, which we're going to talk about a little bit, talk about this heavenly type of wisdom. But first we're going to talk about worldly wisdom and what that is and what that means. Now, as a little bit of a, a breakdown of this verse, um, verse 15 uh, gives three kind of adjectives to kind of define the qualities of what worldly wisdom is. And it mentions that worldly wisdom is earthly, it's unspiritual, some of your versions may say sensual, and it's demonic, and other versions may say devilish. Um, but there's something, um, as it goes on to say in verse 16, that originates out of envy and selfish ambition, and it leads to disorder in every evil practice. This is a wisdom that praises qualities like power, position, prestige as things that are virtuous. And it's this kind of wisdom, if you think about it, and you can probably think of more examples, but it's this kind of wisdom that prompted Satan and his angels to rebel against God out of envy and selfish ambition. It's the same kind of wisdom that prompted the disciples to argue over who would be the greatest in all the kingdom. But I want to talk about um, these three adjectives here at the top, uh, starting off with earthly and kind of dig into this idea a little bit more. Earthly wisdom is wisdom according to the world standards, or as Webster's told us, wisdom that's based on generally accepted beliefs. And uh, we often, there's a lot of things in our culture and society that, uh, you know, we like to use symbols and things like that. And one of the things that is often associated um, with wisdom, watch this. There's, there's your uh, animation for the night. I worked really hard on that. I'm very proud of it. But uh, you want to see it again? Let me see it again. Here we go. <laughs> but uh, we often associate wisdom with owls. And why is that? Well, owls have these really big eyes and this solemn appearance that makes us think that they're wise. And we often turn to owls to help us answer some of life's most burning questions. <laughs> How many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? Now, the owl would tell you that it's one, two, three, crunch, but the end of the commercial, if you remember, always said that the world may never know. Um, and I, I Googled solely searching for this picture, and, and, and you, know, you, you find things on the internet that blow your mind sometimes, and come to find out that a group of engineering students from Purdue University actually determined that on average it takes 364 licks to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop. So, Store that away as some worldly wisdom for you. But the origins of the, the symbol of an owl and being associated with wisdom goes back to Greek mythology. Um, Athena, the goddess of wisdom, was often depicted with an owl. And according to myth, Athena's owl enabled her to see her blind side so that she could see the whole truth, even things that were apparently obscure. And since then, owls have been considered wise, um, but also because of their heightened senses really good hunters, they can see in the dark, see at night. 
And it's this night vision in particular that, ins that really uh, impressed the ancient Greeks, who believed that this vision was a result of some mystical inner light. Um, one of the prominent pieces of currency that we was used in ancient Greece was, was a coin that looked like this. And it depicted Athena on one side and her owl on the other side, further showing that Athena had the ability to see from all sides. In Greek culture in general, dating back for, for many years, has put a great deal of importance on the concept of earthly wisdom. You have men like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, Greek philosophers who were considered great thinkers, purveyors of great wisdom. Which is interesting when we flip over to 1 Corinthians, and you have Paul who's writing a letter to, a, to the church in Corinth, who happened to be at one of the prominent cities in Greece at the time. And he's writing this letter, and we're going to get to this verse in just a moment, but he's writing this letter to a group of people who probably had great familiarity with these philosophers, with Athena, with Athena's owl, maybe even had one of these coins in their pocket. But Paul had a few things to say about this wisdom and the types of people who seek after this kind of wisdom. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. So similar to what James was talking about in James chapter 3, Paul talks about two different types of wisdom, and he's using the example of how people react to the message of the cross as his example. He talks about those who are perishing. Um, those are the people and how they consider the message to be foolishness, which would be worldly wisdom. And those who are being saved and how they consider the message to be the power of God. In other words, heavenly wisdom. And, you know, when we hear things like, you know, you read verse 18, it talks about the message of the cross. That means something to us in this room because we kind of have a, the full scope of the context. We've, we've grown up with the cross being a symbol of Christ. We're, we're familiar with that. Um, but to the Corinthians, this was probably a relatively uh, new concept for them, something that they had to get used to. Um, to them, the cross may very well have not been necessarily a symbol of the gospel, but rather a symbol for a tool that's used to put criminals to death. To them, in their worldly wisdom, the cross may have been a symbol of weakness. Now, worldly wisdom would tell you to put your faith in the people that are strong and mighty, who are proud and successful. And then Jesus comes along, and he was full of peace. He was considerate. He was submissive, full of mercy impartial, sincere, um, which are all qualities that are listed in James chapter 3, verse 17, which we're going to get to in a minute, as, a, as a qualities of a heavenly wisdom. But Jesus was all these things. Now, worldly wisdom would tell you that placing your faith in such a man that died in this perceived weakness would be foolishness. But then Paul has some more things to say, and in verse 19, he makes reference to the book of Isaiah, and he says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. And I love that phrasing here, and this is the NIV, but I like this idea that the intelligence of the intelligent. It makes me think of someone who has the impression and thinks very highly of themselves because they believe that they're very intelligent. And they want you to know that they're very intelligent. This is the type of person who places their whole identity on how wise they think they are, and then only for God to come along and say, I'm going to destroy that wisdom. I'm going to destroy that intelligence. And we often place a great deal and a lot of value in this idea of worldly wisdom, but this is something that will not last. So going on to our next adjective here, um, he says that worldly wisdom is sensual or unspiritual, and this is wisdom according to what feels right. Not necessarily that it is right, but what feels right, based on senses, emotions, and passions. Now, the Greek word here um, is a word that's used to refer to the quality of our natural, tangible bodies, as opposed to things of the spiritual nature. So it's things that, that have to do with us and our bodies and how we feel. <clears throat> and everybody has their own feelings about things, which, uh, like we talked about some other things earlier, this is, this is something where feelings are subjective based on how we see truth. Now, the world's wisdom will tell us that truth is relative, depending on how it makes us feel. So I have a little bit of an, an analogy here. So let's think of a wheel for a second. Now, a wheel is made up of many different parts, um, a lot of different materials, many different parts. 
But each one of those parts has to work seamlessly together in order to ensure that the wheel can spin smoothly and make sure that whatever vessel it's uh, carrying gets to where it needs to go. Now at the top of this wheel is our feelings. Um, and we all have unique feelings. Um, and that's, that's what makes us uh, different and distinct from one another. But the feelings that we have dictate how we interpret reality. Our feelings dictate how we interpret the world that we live in. Now I interpret reality a certain way, you interpret reality a certain way, and because we feel, and we, because we feel different things about the world we live in. And our feelings influence that interpretation. Then how we interpret reality dictates what truth we choose to fill that reality with. I'm going to interpret certain things differently based upon what it is that I believe. Now, to complete this wheel, the truth dictates how we feel and how um, the truth dictates how we feel and shapes our feelings about the world around us. So we have this kind of cycle of uh, what, uh, between the feelings that we have, how we interpret the world we live in, and the actual truth that we put in that reality. Now, if all things remain consistent and we live a life holding to God's truth, the wheel can spin um, evenly. Check this out. More animations for you. But uh, if we choose, um, but, but, let me just go back real quick. Um, so like I said, if uh, all things remain consistent, talking about truth, um, if we choose to fill our, our world with God's truth, then, the, then this whole process can remain even and consistent. Um, but that doesn't mean that the wheel is not going to hit a few bumps along the way, um, but the wheel will still remain intact. Now, what happens if we allow the world's, the world's wisdom to manipulate what we believe is true? That truth becomes altered. The Bible says that we should avoid selfishness, put others before myself. But that doesn't always feel right. How am I supposed to be successful unless I put myself before others? The Bible says that sexual immorality is a sin. But that doesn't always feel right, because love is love. And who am I to say otherwise, even if the Bible preaches against that? We try to convince ourselves that the most important element of this wheel is in fact our feelings, but it's not. It's the truth. And once we allow truth to be manipulated, the wheel gets lopsided, which as James calls or refers to in chapter 3, it creates disorder, creates chaos. We begin to harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition because we're too focused on seeking wisdom that makes us feel a certain way. And Jesus expresses a similar sentiment in Matthew chapter 7 when he talks about the wise man who builds his house on the rock upon God's truth and God's wisdom versus the foolish man who builds his house on the sand upon chaos and disorder. Now the third adjective that James uses here is demonic or devilish. This would be wisdom according to Satan based on his lies. Um, wisdom that uh, finds its origins and influence from, from Satan and his demons. Now, when I was trying to think of an example to use for this, uh, my mind kept going to Matthew chapter 4. And in Matthew chapter 4, we find the story of Jesus being tempted in the desert. And Jesus, you know, he'd been out there for a long time, hadn't eaten. He was, uh, at least from world earthly standards, he would have been vulnerable. But Satan approaches him, and he has some offers that he wants to make to Jesus. And he tells him to, t to speak to the stones and turn them to bread so that he can eat. He tells Jesus to throw himself from the temple so that God can save him. He tells him to worship him so that he, and in return, he would give him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, with every single one of these examples, Satan quotes scripture. And interestingly enough, he quotes the scriptures accurately. Now, obviously, we know that he's quoting them accurately, but he's completely misapplying the proper context of the scriptures. And he's using that with the purposeful intent of leading Jesus astray. But how did Jesus respond? With each new offer, Jesus responds with more scripture to flesh out the proper application that Satan was misapplying. Now, I don't consider myself an overly frightful person, but one of the things that absolutely terrifies me just about more than anything in this world is that Satan knows the scriptures and he knows them well. And he uses that knowledge to purposefully lead us astray. And it's terrifying to think um, about being caught in a situation where Satan knows the scriptures better than I do, and I fall for his schemes. Because unlike Jesus and how he handled it in Matthew chapter 4, 
I haven't equipped myself with the necessary tools to recognize what's even happening. That's why it's important that we remain in the Word and we do our daily Bible readings. We constantly keep our minds focused on Christ so that we don't ever find ourselves in a position where Satan is successfully convincing us that the Bible says something that it doesn't actually say. And I think this is what James was talking about when he talks about that worldly wisdom is demonic. You know, we, we often talk about this, um, the devil on my shoulder concept. Um, we, we, we have Satan whispering things in our ear. And sometimes it's prepackaged in this way that looks appealing. It's prepackaged in this way that comes across as heavenly wisdom, but it's not. It's of the world. Now, as an example of all this, um, I want to talk about Solomon for a moment, but maybe from a little bit of a different perspective. In 1 Kings chapter uh, 3, we read about Solomon and how he asked God for wisdom, or or, uh, the NIV says he asked for a discerning heart. So God comes to Solomon in a dream, and he presents him with a very unique opportunity. Um, And he tells Solomon, ask for whatever you want. And um, you can imagine, you know, all, you start thinking about all the things that you could potentially ask for. You know, the whole, uh, you know, genie shows up and asks you three wishes. What are you going to wish for? More wishes, right? And that's what we would expect somebody to say in that situation. But in that moment, Solomon thanks God for his faithfulness to his father and to him. And he responds, I am only a child and do not know how to carry my duties. We've all been there before. We know that feeling, right? And this is Solomon recognizing that wisdom is not something that comes from within. It's something that he needs help with. But verse 9 says, So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. And God was pleased with this request. He was happy that he didn't ask for things like wealth and long life and honor. So God gave him that wisdom that he asked for. And it said he gave him wisdom so that there will never be anyone like him. And on top of that, just to kind of top it all off, he went ahead and gave him the wealth and honor as well. Just some unintended, positive unintended consequences for Solomon. But then right after that, in chapter 3, we get into a story of Solomon putting this newfound wisdom on display. And it's a really interesting story where you have Solomon, he's holding court, people are coming to him you know, with their problems, and he's having to decide how to handle them. And in this particular instance, we have a story of two prostitutes living in the same house, both of them recently having had babies. And there's an accusation being lodged from one mother against another. And the story says um, that one of the mothers, while she was sleeping, uh, the, the child was in her bed with her, and the child died, passed away. And the mother took that child, went into the other room, swapped out the babies, and brought the living child with her. So the other mother wakes up and realizes what's going on, sees that the baby's not alive, but then also realizes that it's not actually her baby. So you've got two mothers coming to Solomon claiming that the baby belongs to them. And he's having to decide what to do. Now today, obviously, we could just run a DNA test and get it over with, right? But that's not something Solomon had at his disposal. But what he did have is God's wisdom. So his solution is in verse 24. And it says, bring me a sword, cut the living child in two, give half to one and half to the other. Seems like a strange way to approach the situation. Uh, But as we know, this is a ruse by Solomon to, to, to weed out who the lying mother is. And his ruse works. The lying mother accepts the compromise. The real mother concedes her personal interests in the matter to save the child's life, even if that means the child would no longer live with her. Um, But this ruse exposes the lying mother. And in verse 28, it says, When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. Now, we usually look at the story from, or at least I have in in the past, looked at the story from Solomon's point of view because of this wisdom that he had imparted. But I want to focus for a moment on the lying mother because I've always felt like this story is a little bit absurd for a lot of reasons. But mainly, why would the lying mother agree to this compromise? Do you think she woke up that morning thinking, oh, I'm going to court today. Um, There's a possibility that Solomon may want to split the baby in half. And yes, that's that's the option I'm going to go with. Probably not. How is this a satisfying way to settle the matter for her? How would this outcome benefit her in any way? And lastly, who would be willing to kill a baby to further personal gain and selfish agendas? 
Let's go back to our breakdown of James chapter 3 real quick and, and apply what, what, what that verse is telling us, specifically in, in verse 16. Can we say that this woman was acting out of envy and selfish ambition? Absolutely. She was envious of the other mother whose baby was still alive, and she acted out, out of selfish ambition to try to do something about it. Did that envy and selfish ambition lead her to disorder and evil practices? Absolutely. Does this happen today? All the time. And unfortunately, that's the world we live in. And that's what worldly wisdom would have us believe. Worldly wisdom blinds us of the consequences of our envy and selfish ambitions. It leads us to be comfortable and complacent with the disorder and the evil that results from those selfish ambitions. It led this mother to believe that splitting the baby provided her with some type of beneficial outcome. Godly wisdom, on the other hand, is built on God's truth and not superficial truth. And another thing to consider about the story is that, at least in my mind, Solomon knew when he offered this proposal, I feel like he knew that one of these women was going to go with this. That was the whole purpose of the ruse. And they say the best way to catch a criminal is to think like a criminal thinks. And one of the best ways that we can protect ourselves against the effects of worldly wisdom is to understand how it works and how it impacts us. And if we ever find ourselves in a situation where we can recognize that we're acting out of envy and selfish ambition, according to James chapter 3, verse 16, we already know what that's going to lead to. And that's something we should remain mindful of and be vigilant about. But then we go on to verses 17, back to James chapter 3, going on to verse 17, where we talk about heavenly wisdom, wisdom that's from above. And it says, But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good judgment, or excuse me, good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So obviously, uh, I feel like, you know, we're getting towards the end of the book of James, and we're going to start to see James kind of making callbacks to things that we've talked about in, in weeks past. But heavenly wisdom is something that comes from God. We talked about that in James chapter 1. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Wisdom is one of those gifts. And it comes through prayer. We talked about that also in James chapter 1. In verse, James chapter 1 verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But getting into verse um, 17 here, we have a list of qualities that represent heavenly wisdom. And I'm going to put it on a different slide just so we can kind of see them listed out here. But the first thing that he says heavenly wisdom is, he says that it's pure. Above all else, it is true to God's will. And we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, having to make a decision on what kind of truth that we're going to fill our life with. Um, and that's the, the truth from God and from God's word. Heavenly wisdom comes from the purity of God's truth. He goes on to say that heavenly wisdom is peace-loving, something where we hold firm to the truth, but also making effort to be peaceful, to be peace-loving. Um, and an example of this is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, where we're called to speak the truth in an attitude of love. Um, we often associate peacefulness with passivity, but that's not exactly what we're being told here. Remaining true to God's word and handling disagreements in love, that's what we're being called to do which leads nicely in, into our next word here, which is that heavenly wisdom is considerate. Some of your versions may say gentle. That is being kind in our dealings with others, not being harsh even when we know when we're right. Second Timothy chapter two, starting in verse 24 says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. The next word we get into is submissive, or willing to yield. Submissive and not in matters of truth, but in matters of opinion. We see this in Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Accept the ones whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. And as you get further into Romans chapter 14, he goes on, about being submissive and willing to yield in matters of liberty and personal freedoms, scruples. Heavenly wisdom is full of mercy, quick to forgive the offenses of others, wisely understanding one's own need of mercy, which is a concept we talked about a few weeks ago in James chapter 2. 
And in verse 13, it says, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful, because mercy triumphs over judgment. Heavenly wisdom produces good fruit. And if you kind of look back, if you got James chapter 3 open, back in verse 13, where it says that we're to show our good life by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. And we look back on some of the, the lessons of the past weeks. Um, this wisdom that we're talking about, this heavenly wisdom, takes us beyond being only hearers of the word, but turns us into doers of the word. That's in James chapter 1. And in James chapter 2, we talked about the, uh, in the sense of wisdom, it allows us to understand that faith without works is dead. Heavenly wisdom, our next word is impartial. And this is a lesson that Jordan had a few weeks ago, um, showing no favoritism. Rather, treating all fairly on the same basis, regardless of status, wealth, or position. And the last thing it says is that heavenly wisdom is sincere. Some of your Bibles may say that it's without hypocrisy, indicating that all the things we've just talked about, it's not an act, it's not a show, that we're able to show that our walk matches our talk. It comes from a heart desiring to please God, not desiring to please man. So we're going to finish right on time here. We've talked about worldly wisdom, and this is a wisdom that causes confusion and disorder and all evil things. And then we've also talked about heavenly wisdom, which produces peace instead of that confusion, bears the fruit of righteousness instead of those evil things. Now, the takeaway from all this is we have to decide in our lives which type of wisdom that we want to seek out and put into practice. And then the unfortunate part about this is that worldly wisdom requires little to no effort. We just have to do what the world tells us to do. Follow the trends. Just do what feels right. Allow Satan to hand deliver us to us the things that we should not be doing. But then on the flip side, seeking heavenly wisdom requires a little bit of diligence, does it not? We're called to seek out wisdom from God. And in doing so, the good news is, is that God said he will grant it to those who seek and ask for it. And then once we have that wisdom, we have to demonstrate that wisdom with our actions. And that's all I got for tonight. Let's uh, close out with a, with a prayer and we'll be done.